As we go to open God's word together, let's ask him to bless it to us. Let us pray. Father in heaven, let us hear of your steadfast love in Christ, for in you we trust. Make us know the way we should go, for to you we lift up our souls. Deliver us from our enemies, O Lord. We have fled to you for refuge. Teach us to do your will, for you are our God. And let your good spirit lead us now on level ground. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. And please turn with me in God's word to the book of Galatians, chapter 5. Galatians, chapter 5. You'll find that on page 1239 in many of the Pew Bibles. And it's between the books of 2 Corinthians and Ephesians. Galatians chapter 5, and we're going to read some probably well-known words from chapter 5, verses 16 through 25 on the fruit of the Spirit and talk together about the fight for holiness. So we want to read, uh, beginning our reading at Galatians chapter 5, verse 16 and reading through verse 25, and let's pay careful attention for this is God's own word. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident, sexual sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Thus far the reading of God's Word. May He bless it to us. Uh, We've been considering a series through the Catechism, and we considered last time from Lord's Day 32 about why we do good works from the positive side, Um, and then the Catechism also has a negative question, and I thought maybe we would just pass by that and move on to the next Lord's Day. But as I continue to reflect on that question, um, it's an important question and a question I think that Christians can take and misapply to themselves um, and allow these things to become more of a hindrance to them than a help to them. Um, And that can be something that happens to us when we confront the warnings in Scripture. Uh, They have a very serious warning that Paul warns us with in this passage And we have a serious warning that's conveyed in the catechism, right? That those who do not turn from their ungrateful and unrepentant ways will not inherit the kingdom of God. Um, It's been noted that the list of things in Heidelberg Catechism, question 87, um, it comes almost word for word from 1 Corinthians 6, 9, and 10. But we can see ties to a list of similar things in Ephesians chapter 5, uh, verses 1 through 20, in 1 John 3, 14. And also here in our passage in Galatians 5, 19 through 21. And what this Lord's Day is meant to remind us and meant to bring to our minds again and again um, is that faith is always working. Um, it's a wonderful quote that I like from Martin Luther. He said, oh, it is, oh, that is, let me try again. I do love the quote and I will try to say it. Um, oh, it is a living, busy, active, mighty thing, this faith. Uh, It is a living, busy, active, mighty thing, this faith. It was his way of saying faith always is looking for something to do. Um, Faith is always looking for something to do, trusting in God and then looking to work in love for God, for our neighbor. Faith is an active, busy thing. Um, And that's the clear teaching of Scripture. Faith is always working. And we always want to be clear, right, that we're not saved by our works, 
Our works don't save us. They don't contribute to our salvation in the sense of making us right with God. But there also is no such thing as salvation where works don't exist, uh, where there isn't any goodness that follows. We always say works, good works, accompany a true faith. We're saved by grace alone, through faith alone, on account of Christ alone, but that faith never remains alone. It never remains dead or unbusy or inactive. It must work. It always works to produce the fruits of repentance and gratitude in the life of the Christian. Um, I like how one person put it, we are not saved by our good works or on their account, but nor are we saved without good works. They always follow uh, from faith. They always have fruit of faith. And someone who says they have faith and has no good work, where there is no fruit of repentance or gratitude in their lives, how can they say that they have a true faith? Doesn't James say it very plainly? For as a body apart from the spirit is dead, so faith apart from works is dead. Uh, where there are no good works, certainly true faith and life from God are also lacking. And God's Word contains that clear warning. Those who walk in wickedness will certainly not inherit the kingdom of God. Uh, the challenge for us, I think, is for us to listen to these warnings seriously, but also for Christians who have put their faith and trust in Christ to use these things as God has intended for us to use them. Uh, because there's a way that we can hear these warnings and find them condemning us when that is not the purpose for which God has given them to Christians. Um, why do the Scriptures contain these kinds of serious warnings? Um, so that Christians would make use of them. Speaking about the serious warnings in the book of Hebrews, Dr. Hal Jones said, the whole subject is dealt with in order to help professing believers, not to hinder them. It's possible to interpret the marks of grace the tests of life, in a way that disqualifies. What the biblical authors were doing was the exact opposite, the exact reverse. They're not giving these things to Christians to discourage them. They're not giving these warnings to Christians to hinder them in their Christian walk. They're giving these warnings to help people, uh, to recognize the things that are true. We have to take the warnings seriously uh, but there are so often Christians who have taken the warning seriously, but then continue to apply them to their lives in a way where they see them disqualifying them. And that is a danger with lists like we have in 1 Corinthians 6 that's repeated for us in the Catechism. Because who of us who's not honest does not look through that list and see some sin we're guilty of? Right? We, we look through those lists, and part of the things that we can find troubling is you say, well, I've done that. And here the Word is saying, if you've done that, you won't inherit the kingdom of God. And what do Christians sometimes do then is they say, am I going to inherit the kingdom of God? Am I disqualified? Um, and what we want to do is properly listen to those warnings, but for Christians who have listened to the warnings... Uh, they don't need to stand in fear of them or use them in a way that disqualifies them in a way that God's Word does not intend for us to use them. Um, we want to think about this and think about Galatians 5, 16 through 25 as one such passage. That maybe sometimes Christians like to, we like to talk about the fruit of the Spirit, but maybe we don't like to meditate on the whole of the passage because we worry about the warning, we worry about the list of sins, we worry about the disqualifying kinds of things that it says. And I want for us to really pay attention to the warnings, but for Christians also to understand how God is using these warnings to help us in the Christian life, uh, to help us understand things properly so that we fight the war for holiness that we need to fight in the way that we're supposed to fight it. So I want to look at this, I wanted to look at this question not to be you know, if you think this is going to be a hellfire and brimstone sermon, no, um, that's not what I'm going to do with the warning. I want to particularly say, how do Christians relate to these warnings? How do Christians relate to these calls to holiness? And how do we rightly apply these things to our lives in a way that helps? And so I want to look at, at Galatians 5, 16 to 25 as kind of a lesson in this for us, to understand properly what the Word is saying to us 
about the nature of the fight for holiness uh, by looking at these verses and first looking at the evident truth that Paul communicates to us, the essential perspective we need to maintain in, in seeking to live a holy life, and the enduring call that comes to God's people. Um, so I want to think about this passage in that way, the evident truth, the essential perspective, and the enduring call. Uh, Paul talks about an evident truth. Uh, Americans should be well acquainted with these kinds of ideas, right? Our Declaration of Independence says we hold these truths to be self-evident. Uh, and Paul, in a sense here, is saying, I want to talk to you about some truths that are evident, uh, that, are, that are obvious. And that's what he says in verse 19. He's going to talk about some things that are evident, that are obvious. What does he say in verse 19? <clears throat> now, the works of the flesh are evident. Um, they're clearly seen. It's not hard to know what these things are. Uh, the word evident just means to be clearly and easily able to be known. Um, in our modern way, might, we might say this is first day stuff. This is not complicated. Paul's saying something that was obvious to everyone who heard him. And in the same way, that list that's really repeated from 1 Corinthians 6, 9, and 10 starts with Paul saying, or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? But the way he asks that question is to say, of course you know what the answer to this is. Do you expect the unrighteous to inherit the kingdom of God? How could the unrighteous inherit a kingdom that's a kingdom of godliness and of righteousness and self-control? Um, he's stating the obvious to them there as he's stating the obvious to the Galatians here. The works of the flesh are evident. Uh, we, we know these things. These are evident truths, that these are the kinds of things that people who do and who live in this way in a kind of unrepentant and habitual way can't hope to enter the kingdom of God, that those who do these things and don't turn from them to God have no part in His kingdom. It's an obvious truth. It's that obvious truth that necessitated a Savior. Right? We couldn't have lived because we are these kinds of people left to ourselves. In ourselves, we are dead in sin and trespasses. We are these kinds of unrighteous people. We couldn't enter the kingdom of heaven the way we were because it's evident that we didn't belong there. That was why God in His mercy sent His Son into the world to save sinners who in themselves were unfit for the kingdom of God. Um, to renew them by the blood of His Son, and, to redeem them by the blood of His Son, and to renew them by His Spirit, so that He could make them fit participants in the kingdom of God. Um, it's interesting that in, in both 1 Corinthians 6 and here in Galatians 5, Paul is saying, I, I warn you, if this is your life, if this is your life unturned towards God and unrepentant, you should be warned. But for those who have been redeemed by Christ, who are being renewed by His Spirit, we need to remember that these things were true of us and are not true of us now. Right? This list that's reproduced in question 87 that's taken from 1 Corinthians 6, 9, and 10, if you go on to read in 1 Corinthians 6, 11, Paul goes on to say, and such were some of you, but you've been washed. This is what you used to be. This is not who you are now. And Paul helps us to understand in our passage here, what are we now? Uh, what has God made us, made all Christians who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, what has He made us? He has made us those who are led by the Spirit. In verse 18, we're led by the Spirit. We are those who belong to Jesus Christ. And verse 24 goes on to say, not only do we belong to Jesus Christ, but we have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. For every Christian, this is who God has made us. Now, th there's uh, two, two evident truths to think about. First, of what clearly is works that don't belong to the kingdom of God, and that we are clearly people who do belong to the kingdom of God. We're led by the Spirit. We belong to Christ Jesus. We have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. This is who God has made us. We used to be something, and then by God's grace, we repented 
of that. We turned away and we turned to God and we were brought into His kingdom. By the redeeming work of Christ, by the renewing work of His Spirit, we have been changed. We belong to Him. Our flesh has been crucified with its passions and desires. We're not now led by our sinful nature, we're led by the Spirit. And if we don't understand that this is who we clearly are now, we won't really be able to make sense of what Paul is saying here. Um, If this passage is used by Christians not to help them pursue holiness, um, but as a way that is always disqualifying them as they read it, it will hinder them in their walk, not help them. And Paul gave these things to to the Galatians to help them in their Christian walk. Um, to help them to produce the things of righteousness, to help them understand how to fight the fight of holiness and how to better walk with the Lord. So anybody who is unrepentant in sin, who has not turned to God, they should be scared by these warnings. But for Christians who have heard the warnings, who've turned to God in repentance and faith, uh, they don't need to be afraid. He's teaching us important essential truths And that's pretty simple, that evil works that belong to our old selves don't have any place now in our new lives. Um, they're They're not the things we're trying to do. We're trying to be new creations. We've been made new things in Christ, and we need to pursue those things, not the old ways in which we once walked. So we have to understand that evident truth. Paul's simply saying, we know the things that don't have any place in our lives anymore. We know what we've been called to in living the Christian life. And we need to keep those, that truth in mind that Paul is saying is evident so that we can maintain an essential perspective on the nature of holiness and the fight for holiness in this life. We have to move from that truth to help us maintain a perspective in life in this world. Because we belong to Christ... Because the flesh has been crucified with its passions and desires, because we are led by the Spirit, we've been freed from slavery to sin. It no longer has dominion over us the way it used to have. Um, We need that perspective to remember we are not slaves to sin anymore. We've been set free. But we also need to remember that although we've been set free from the slavery that we have had to sin, we've not been set free entirely from the struggle with sin, right? Paul Paul talks often in his writings about the struggle that we have because we have a new self that's been created in Christ Jesus that's led by the Spirit, but we have this old self that still remains, this remainder of who we used to be, right? Paul talks about that, doesn't he? The old self with its desires, the body of death that we carry around. He talks about it in some different ways. And so we have to maintain this perspective on our lives. I'm freed from the slavery of sin as a Christian, but that doesn't mean I still don't struggle. Um, There still is this remainder in us. Uh, The canons of Dort teach this, um, as Dr. Godfrey, Robert Godfrey, a.k.a. Dad, said. uh, We are no longer entirely controlled and directed by sin, in our alienation from God, but we are not completely or fully liberated from sin in this life. Sin continues to be present in and with us. As Christians, we face a lifelong battle against sin and the sin that remains in us. And that's one of the great themes of this second part of the book of Galatians, as one person put it. The the whole great theme is that in Christ, life is liberty. We've been set free And that's a wonderful thing, to be new creations in Christ and to be set free, to really enjoy liberty through the redeeming and renewing work of the Lord. The problem is we have these remains of sin in us, the old self, our outer members competing with the inner man, as Paul puts it. And we we struggle then to use our liberty correctly. And what are the two things Paul has warned about the problem of liberty? What does the old self do with liberty? Either the old self is so used to slavery, it tries to find other things to be enslaved to. 
And Paul warns the, the Galatians against that in Galatians 5 verse 1. For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. So Paul's saying, you've been set free to live a free life, and what do we do with that? We want to relapse into slavery, find something else to be enslaved to. Paul says, we, we can't do that. That's not what Christ has set us free for. So if one danger is that we'll take this liberty that we have and relapse into slavery, what's the other danger that we'll do with our liberty? We'll say, oh, I can go, now I can go do whatever I want. Um, we, don't, we don't relapse into slavery, we run into license, doing whatever we want to do, and Paul warns us against that as well. In the same chapter, Galatians 5.13, For you are called to freedom, brothers, only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. We've been set free, that's the great theme, but how are we going to use this freedom correctly? Um, if left to ourselves, we would do one of the two things. We would take our liberty and relapse into slavery or run into license. We wouldn't use it the way God has called us to use it. So how will we be governed correctly? How will we properly wage this war that's going on between the old self and what it desires and the new self created after Christ Jesus? Um, we have to be led by the Spirit. So we have to understand that perspective of the, the war that's going on with us and understand what the flesh in us is trying to do. Right? It's, it's, proper, it's important for us to have that right perspective on what Paul is talking about when he talks about the flesh. Now, most of the time when we hear desires of the flesh, that conjures up simply images of, of sexual desire, and that's, that's part of the desires of the flesh, but that's not entirely what Paul's talking about here. By the flesh, he means what we are by nature, our fallen condition. So we have this fallen condition, our flesh, that continues to desire those things it shouldn't desire, those things that are part of the old self, that are, that are apart from the kingdom of God, the desires that have no part in the Christian. That is that old man, the old self. That's how Paul is thinking about that. Those are the desires of the flesh. That's what the old self wants. That's the flesh that Paul is talking about here. It's not who we really are in our inner man and in our inner self anymore created after the image of Christ Jesus. They represent the things we used to be, the things we used to do, the things that we used to be enslaved to but aren't anymore. And what Paul wants us to understand is to have this perspective. We're no longer slaves, but we still struggle. We've been freed, but we have to struggle to use that freedom correctly. And there's a part of us that's always drawing us to do bad things, to walk away from the new self we've been created in, and then to do the things we know we shouldn't do. Right? That's how Paul expresses it in Romans 7 in terms of his struggle with the body of death. I have this old self in me that keeps wanting to do the things I know I shouldn't do and the things I don't really want to do in my inner self. And it's important that we have this perspective of there is a war going on within us. Um, it's a very serious kind of warfare between who we used to be and who we are, the remains of the old self and the new self. They're at war. They're at war with the desires that are going on. Um, and commentators talking about this war use lots of, uh, um, lots of instructive imagery. These two natures, the flesh and the new self, are in sharp opposition. They're, the war between them is fierce and unremitting. They live in irreconcilable antagonism and are fighting an interminable deadly feud. Um, at war within us are these two, these two selves, um, and one person summarized, the Christian conflict is fierce, it's bitter, and unremitting. By himself, the Christian simply could not be victorious. Um, so you might think, well, this is great, Pastor. We talked all morning about life as a constant death, and now you're saying life is a constant warfare. Uh, thank you. Happy, you know, first Sunday of Advent. Thank you very much for all of this. Um, but Paul wants us to have this perspective, there's a warfare going on, but here's where the good news enters in. The warfare is not simply between our old selves and our new selves. 
What does Paul helpfully show us here? And what is the essential perspective that he maintains here? There is someone else fighting with the new self against the old self. It's not just a completely internal battle that we are waging between our two selves. What what is the good news that Paul gives to Christians? The spirit is on the side of the new self. The spirit is at war with you against the old self that you used to be. Um, The spirit has declared war on the old self. The spirit is filling you with desires that are contrary to the old self. See how that becomes an encouraging way of thinking about verse 17. For the desires of the flesh are against the spirit, and the desires of the spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. You see the hope that Paul is really offering Christians in this? There are desires created by the Spirit that are opposed to the desires of the old self. The Spirit is waging that war against the old self and creating in us desires that are opposed to the desires of the old self and that keep us from doing the things that the old self wants to do. There's now a prevailing Spirit at work in us that gives us hope. If we had to fight this warfare in our own strength, we would fail. Uh, We would fail utterly to fight, but we're not called to fight this war by ourselves. The inner man is renewed by the Holy Spirit who indwells us and fights against the old self, creates in us desires that are hostile to the desires of the old self. That's good news, that there is help in this struggle from the Spirit who is mightier than the old self. And that's then what Paul is calling us to do, to listen to those desires that are of the Spirit and to walk by the Spirit. Uh, To to listen to those desires, those desires that will help counter those sinful desires. And if you walk by the Spirit, what's the hope? Then you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Um, The hope Paul gives to Christians is to say, if we continue to walk by the Spirit, if we continue to allow those desires to cancel out the desires of the old self, if we listen to the Spirit and follow the Spirit's lead and walk with the Spirit, what will we do? The desires will still be there. The old self will still chime in in our lives. But what won't we do? We won't do what the old self is telling us to do. The desires that He creates in us will be canceled out by the Spirit um, so that we won't gratify. We might still feel the desires. You know, Martin Luther, talking about the fight for holiness too, said, you know, we're not stocks and blocks. We're not people that don't get acted on by those sinful desires. They're there. But what does the desire of the Spirit help us to do? Not to carry through on those desires. It helps us to find a way out from under temptation so that we don't just succumb, but can, in each individual sin from time to time, overcome them. That we feel that desire at times, but we don't gratify it. We don't act on it. Now, I think a lot of Christians struggle because they're well aware of those areas in their lives where they have trouble saying no to the old self. Um, Some areas we have figured out how to better not gratify the desires of the sinful flesh, where we have figured out how better to deny those, and there are other areas of the Christian life that we're still working on, uh, where we still see a lot more struggle in our lives. Um, It's a progressive kind of thing. Um, But one of the things that some Christians do is then they see the areas they struggle and they think, well, that must mean the Spirit's not at work at all. Um, Or maybe I'm not even being renewed by the Spirit. Maybe I'm not even redeemed. Maybe I don't even belong to His kingdom. You know, this can be, you can use these things in a way that hinders your walk when God has meant them to help you. He's meant to say there's help in walking with the Spirit. We're not left to ourselves. 
And one of the things Paul is helping us to do in this passage also is to give us the essential perspective of saying we are alive in the Spirit. We belong to Jesus. The the old self is crucified along with its passions and desires. We do live by the Spirit. And because we live by the Spirit, we ought to walk by the Spirit. If we don't understand that distinction that Paul's making either, if we don't understand and have that perspective in mind, we're not going to make sense of this passage either. There's a difference between what Paul is saying when he's talking about living by the Spirit and when he's talking about walking by the Spirit. And, And what is that essential difference? It's this. Living by the Spirit is who we are in Christ. We do live by the Spirit. Walking by the Spirit is what we're called to do. And if we understand that distinction, it'll help us make better use of this passage. We could translate verse 25 this way. If the Spirit is the source of your life, let the Spirit also direct your course. You're a Christian. Those old ways have no part in your life. Walk in step instead with the Spirit. It's as if Paul is saying, you know your new life in Christ is lived by the Spirit, therefore your conduct should keep in line, should keep in step with the Spirit. And that's what our goal should be in this life. And that's why the Catechism draws out these ideas from passages like this, um, that it's impossible for those who live by the Spirit not to walk with Him, that good works are the outward manifestation of of living in the Spirit, that living by the Spirit is the root of the good we do, and that walking by the Spirit is the fruit of the good works that we produce. And the fruit of the Spirit is nothing less than, as one person put it, the practical reproduction of the character and therefore the conduct of Jesus Christ in the life of His people. That's what the Spirit is doing in us. He's causing us to desire those things that actually bear good fruit. What did we talk about in connection with good works last week? If you don't remember, I'll remind you. Or if you weren't here, I'll remind you. Um, What was the thing that Paul was hammering home in Titus? Good works are profitable. They're good for you. They're good in of themselves. They're excellent things. That's what God wants to work in us things that are profitable and excellent. And why does he want us to stay away from those other things? They're unprofitable and useless. What what do the desires of the flesh produce? They produce works that just try to gratify the sinful nature. And what is the problem with the sinful nature? Um, It's like the fire that never says enough. You can't satisfy a sinful desire. You can only gratify it for a time, but it will never say enough. Proverbs talks about, you know, the the fire never says enough. If you set a fire on a Santa Ana day, don't do this. If you set a fire on a Santa Ana day, it'll keep burning. The fire never reaches a point and says, you know what, that's enough destruction. The fire never wraps up on its own. And Proverbs says, you know, that's what fire is like. It never says enough. Sinful desire is like that. It never says enough. You can't gratify, you can't satisfy it. You can gratify it for a time. And that's really what the Lord is saving us from. A life of pursuing things that are not good and are useless and will not profit us at all. Things we will always chase and never find, that never offer any kind of satisfaction. But what does the Holy Spirit do by the things He causes us to desire? He promises fruit. He promises profitable things that will actually satisfy. That's why we sang Psalm 1 in connection with our study this evening, because there is the comparison between the person who doesn't produce anything, who's left with nothing in the end, and in the end simply is blown away like chaff that, that is gone, and the person who is like a tree planted by 
living water that bears fruit in season. The Lord is saving us from a life of profitlessness. And that's what Paul is urging on Christians. We must walk in step with the Spirit who's meaning to produce in us things that are fruitful, that are good, that mean life. That's what God is working in us by His Spirit. Calvin said this, the death of the flesh is the life of the Spirit. If God's Spirit lives in us, let Him govern all our actions. As the soul does not live idly in the body, but gives motion and vigor to every part, so the Spirit of God cannot dwell in us without manifesting Himself by outward effects. By life here is meant the inward power, and by walk the outward actions. Paul meant that works are witnesses to spiritual life. See how Calvin is helping us say living by the Spirit is, is the inward power. Walking by the Spirit is the outward manifestation. And so then how does this passage come to Christians? It comes to us as an enduring call to continue to fight against the desires of the flesh by walking in step with the desires of the Spirit knowing that when we are walking in step with the Spirit, those desires He creates in us are fighting against the sinful desires of our flesh. They're the promise to us. He's the promise to us that we will not gratify the desires of the flesh. We might still fill the pull in this life, but we won't gratify them. We won't make them happen. And we can hope in this, Paul says, because our flesh has been crucified. Not just our flesh, but its passions and desires. They've been conquered by the death of the Son of God. They have been crucified. It's a past tense. It's a thing that's over. And then that means the calling in our lives is to treat them like they're dead. Right? To leave them on the cross and not go back to them and try to offer them something, or try to hold them up, or keep them alive, right? It's a a vicious kind of image, right? We understand how bad crucifixion is. Um, And what Paul is essentially saying is, let the sins die on their crosses. Let them die. Stop coming back to them. Render them what they are. They don't have a right to live in us anymore. And so we have to fight against them as much as possible and fight them with the desires of the Spirit to keep us from doing the things that we want to do and to produce in us those things that are not gratifications of sinful desires but satisfactions of righteous desires. Our calling is to walk in line with the Spirit. What happens with Christians is from time to time we step out of line. We, we walk in ways that we shouldn't walk. Um, sin is deceitful, and we go after things that we shouldn't go after. We stop listening to the word that tells us those things won't satisfy, and we think to ourselves, yeah, but this time it might, and we go after it. But what does the Christian do when it's confronted? The Spirit will always come to the Christian again and say, you're out of step. You're out of line. The Spirit will speak to us through His word. And show us the way again. And what do Christians do when they've wandered off the path? They're shown the truth by the Spirit. And the Spirit says, you know where you need to go. And the Christian says, I need to turn around from where I'm going and get back in step with the Spirit. It's interesting. In verse 16, Paul uses the usual language for walking. In verse 25, he uses a much different kind of expression. Um, Keep in step with the Spirit. That's sort of literally walk the line or walk in the footsteps in front of you. Go exactly where you see Him going, right? Um, You can think of a movie where someone's walking through, you know, if you step in the wrong place, some trap is going to be sprung. And someone who knows the way walks through and says, okay, now walk exactly where I walk. You put your feet where I put my feet. That's what the Spirit is saying to us. You walk behind me. Put my feet where you see my feet. Walk the way I've told you to walk. Keep in line. Keep in step. 
And a Christian that has stepped out of, out of line, gone, gone the way they shouldn't have gone, the Spirit will always call them back, will always turn, will always be brought back. But there's always heartache involved in that. And that's the goodness of our God. What does He want us to do? He wants us to avoid that, the painful process of realizing you're out of step and that you need to come back. And the calling here is to not do that to ourselves, to not have to go the hard way around, but instead to walk with the Spirit more and more, to turn from those other paths and walk with Him and live. And one of the things that we can be helped to know in closing as we fight this perpetual warfare is that this warfare is perpetual in this life. Um, but there is a time coming when the warfare will be over. Um, we struggle with sanctification because it's a process, and we know from time to time how little progress we seem to, to have made, or we make progress in one area and then we seem to not progress in another, or we make a little progress here and we seem to backtrack a little here. And so it's, it's an unremitting fight. It's hard. There are desires that are pulling, and too often we stumble into those desires. But what is the promise? The promise that the Word gives us is the Spirit will kill off the old self in the end. We won't always be of a divided mind between the things that we really want to do and these nagging desires that we know we should say no to. But one day the Spirit in the life to come will kill off those old desires completely. We won't be divided of mind anymore. We'll only walk in step with the Spirit and we'll be perfected after the image of the Lord. And so what these passages on holiness are really telling us is be who you are. Practice being who you will be. There's a day when you will always walk in step. You will perf the Spirit will have perfectly reproduced the character of Jesus Christ his character and his conduct in us, so that when we see him, we will be like him. And so Christians should fight now to be that. And to know that when we fail, we have an advocate before the Father. That Jesus died for sinners. And when he called us, he knew that we were sinners. And that those who turn to him in repentance will always find a Lord that forgives and a spirit that empowers us to walk in step. You see, if we think about it that way, it's a help to us and not a hindrance. It's a help to Christians and encouragement to fight the good fight of sanctification in the assurance that the Spirit will bring us victory. May God give us the grace to practice being who we are um, and get a glimpse of who we one day will be with His help. Amen. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we come to passages like this and recognize so many ways in which we walk out of step with the Spirit. We pray, Lord, that when we do, that you would create in us a repentant heart, that we would be sorry for our sins. And if there are any here who are truly living in wickedness and totally unrepentant, showing no evidence of faith or the fruit of good work, Lord, we pray that you would touch their hearts and cause them to flee to Christ for salvation. But we know that there are so many Christians who wrestle with the struggle of the Christian life, and we thank you that the passage is honest with us about the desires that are at war within us, and that we are honest not only about the, the warfare, but of the strength of the Spirit on our side. And so, Lord, help us more and more to keep in step with the Spirit, to walk according to His Word, to continue to keep His path before us by attending worship and by private acts of devotion and Bible reading and, and singing songs to encourage our hearts, that we'd be reminded of the Spirit's path in His Word that we're to walk, and that He would help us by His strength to walk it, and that we might see the desires of the Spirit driving out the desires of the flesh and keeping us from gratifying them, but rather producing the work and the fruit of the Spirit, which is all of those lovely things listed in the passage, how we desire to be those people. And for Christians who desire these things, would you remind us that blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. 
And then may we give you the glory. Hear us and help us to live sanctified lives, we pray, for we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's take up our Psalters once again, and as a song of response, sing number 466, My Faith Looks Up to Thee. We'll stand and sing all the verses of number 466. Beloved congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ, lift up your hearts now to the Lord and receive His blessing. And may the God of peace Himself sanctify you completely. And may your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be and abide with you all. Amen. Amen. People of God, go in peace. Amen.